Welcome everyone and uh, thanks for coming. As Philip says, this is my second time in this seminar. The last one was almost two years ago. It's hard to believe that we've been doing this for two years. Hopefully uh, next time that we'll do it, there will be other options. Uh, so what I want to uh, discuss today is uh, what's been going on beyond the classical theory of uniform distribution in the last um, few years. So this is a very uh, introductory level talk. Uh, so I apologize in advance for people who are uh, more expert. I see several here in the audience. It's not for them. It's more for people from outside the subject. Uh, so the plan is to uh, give a five minute survey of the theory, the classical theory of uniform distribution. That's a theory that started out uh, about a century or so ago, uh, with the works by Hardy and Littlewood, by Herman Weil, by Van der Korput and other people. And uh, this is a theory that, that has been going on for a while. And uh, much more recently, um, the focus of the research uh, has moved to uh, much finer quantities, which I will describe presently, uh, namely uh, near, uh, nearest neighbor spacing, pair correlations, and related uh, quantities. And some of this uh, research has been driven by questions that have come from outside of number theory or even mathematics, uh, which have to do with uh, uh, problems in uh, quantum chaos, and also from new features of the zeros of the Riemann zeta function, which have been discovered about 50 years ago, so which I'll also very briefly describe. And so uh, the plan is to spend a few minutes on the classical theory of uniform distribution then define these uh, finer statistics and uh, describe how they occur in random models. And then in the theory of the Riemann zeta function and in quantum chaos, this will be just a few minutes. And then in the second half of the talk, I will discuss um, how these uh, quantities are manifested in the uh, examples and standard examples of classical uniform distribution theory. There are new things to be done. So let's just start with uh, the classical theory of uniform distribution. And in this theory, we take a sequence of real numbers and look at their fractional parts, which are numbers between zero and one. And then we say that the sequence is uniformly distributed mod one if any subinterval of the unit interval or the unit circle contains uh, the proportion of points that it contains is asymptotically the length of the interval. So that's this definition here. And in particular, a uniformly distributed sequence must be dense. So here are three examples, numerical examples. The first one is you take uh, uh, the numbers just to be an arithmetic progression um, with an, an irrational step. So take root two times n to be definite and look at the fractional parts of that sequence. And here is a histogram of these fractional parts. So what you see here, um, I, I, I took 10,000 points, n running from one to 10,000. And I bin them into, uh, I think, 20 bins, each of uh, like one over 20. And you see the, the height of the bars is the number of points that fall into each bin. So there's roughly 500 points which fall into each bin in this particular example of root 2 times n. So this is uniform distribution, whatever the definition is. This is uniform distribution because each bin visibly contains essentially the same number of points. Here's another example. Instead of root two times n, let's take the sequence log n and look at its fractional part. It's essential to look at the fractional part. 
And now if you look at this experiment where I take 10,000 points and divide them into bins, into 20 bins, visibly uh, not all bins contains roughly the same number of points. So this sequence is experimentally not uniformly distributed. And as an exercise, I suggest that you just prove that it will not be uniformly distributed. So these are two easy examples. Um, here is a, another example, which is not too difficult when you take uh, the sequence to be square root of integers and look at the remain at the fractional parts. And then you see here that it is roughly uniformly distributed because uh, the bin heights seem to oscillate around uh, 500, which is the mean value. It's not as uniformly distributed as this so-called chronicle sequence of root two times n, but it's certainly uniformly distributed if you compare it to the picture of log n. So these are three good examples to keep in mind. And uh, I think the experiments are very convincing. Um, so let's look at more examples without uh, the numerics this time. So uh, the example that I discussed can be generalized. Instead of root two times n, you take alpha times n. If alpha is one, then the fractional part will always be zero. So that's not so interesting. So you make alpha irrational. And then the statement is that the fractional parts of alpha times n are uniformly distributed as long as alpha is irrational. The example that we looked at before can be proven not to be uniformly distributed, the fractional parts of log n. Um, so this was all known um, in the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, Hermann Weil made a huge breakthrough in this theory and invented a method that allowed one uh, to prove various sequences are uniformly distributed. For instance, if you look at alpha times n squared, when alpha is irrational, then Weil proved that this is uniformly distributed. Um, invented the method of what are called now Weil sums and Weil differencing and so on for this purpose. And more generally, if you take the values of any polynomial at integer points, as long as there's one non-trivial coefficient with it, which is irrational, then the sequence that you get is uniformly distributed mod one. Again, this is Hermann Weil. Another example that will be particularly relevant for me is uh, instead of n squared, you take n to the theta. Well, theta is any number. So if theta is an integer, then this falls under uh, Weil's example. But you can take non-integer thetas. For instance, the case I'm interested in is theta equals a half. And the statement is that for any non-zero alpha and any non-integer theta, this sequence alpha times n to the theta is uniformly distributed mod one. So again, this is old stuff. So people who want to read up on this, there's a classic book by Kuipers and Niederreiter, which describes this theory very succinctly. Um, another example of a result in a classical result, which I think is due to Weil, is that if you take any sequence of distinct integers and look at the dilates by multiply them by alpha, then for almost all alpha, you get a sequence which is uniformly distributed. Almost all is in the sense of the big measure. Now, if you apply it to the sequence of powers of 10, for instance, uh, the statement is that almost all dilates of 10 to the n are uniformly distributed. And that turns out to be equivalent to the statement that alpha is normal. Now, what is normal? Uh, for, you take the base 10 expansion of alpha. And for instance, you'd ask, how often is the digit 3 appearing? What proportion of the, digit, of the digits that you get are equal to 3? And the answer should be 1 uh, tenth, because 3 shouldn't be different than 5, 7, 9, or 2. And likewise, if you take any uh, string of k bits, uh, k digits, uh, 
where k is x, let's say k is seven. So any string of seven digits should occur equally often. That means with frequency one over 10 to the seven in the decimal expansion. So a, a number that satisfies this is called normal. And uh, Vaz metric theorem says that almost all alpha are normal in base 10 or base three or base two, your any of your favorite bases. Um, so this uh, normality is a subject that I think was started by Emil Borel in the beginning of the 20th century. And this uh, gave a proof of that almost all numbers are normal, but uh, we don't really know any natural, any, any nice number that is normal. Uh, uh, so for instance, we don't know that root two is normal or cube root or two or pi or e or any algebraic number is not known to be normal, even though we believe that any algebraic irrationality is normal in any basis. Um, there are explicit examples that you can write down uh, that are provably normal for one base. For instance, um, uh, Champenon, I believe when he was in high school or an undergraduate wrote down this number. So you take, um, you just concatenate all the uh, number base 10 expansions of consecutive integers like for 0 0.1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, and so on. And this you can prove is normal to base 10, but is not known to my, the best of my knowledge uh, to be normal in any other base. Um, and there are other examples like this. I wrote down the one which is due to Stoneham, uh, which is normal to base two, but was proven not to be normal to base six. Um, so the study of normal numbers is a, it's still a big and ongoing uh, subject. And uh, for instance, Veronica Bashir, who's here in the audience is an expert on this. And there are many interesting questions about them, but uh, the most, for me, the most interesting question is whether root two is normal and that is not known. Uh, there are many preprints proving it, but none that can survive. Okay, so this uh, in a few minutes is the classical theory of uniform distribution, some of the highlights. Now let's move beyond. So once we know that the sequence is uniformly distributed, uh, we can look at finer statistics. These are people have started looking at those only very recently on the scale and the time scales of this theory. So uh, I'll discuss two such quantities, the level spacing distribution and the pair correlation function. So here's the definition. You take a sequence of points in the unit interval or the unit circle. So let's call them x1 to xn. And now let's order them. And when you order them, which is a non-trivial operation, we give them a different name. So people call this the order statistics. So in the example we had before, we took a square root of two times n. That's an ordered sequence of real numbers. But when you look at the mod one, the ordering gets mixed up. So you get something completely different. So uh, to, to uh, highlight this, I gave them different names. So the E's are the order statistics. It's the same sequence of points, but now labeled according to the order in which they lie in the unit interval. Okay, once you order them, you look at the gaps between nearest neighbors in this ordering. So if you are, there are n points in the unit interval, then on average, the size of, of the gap is one over n. That's the definition of an average. Um, and you ask for the distribution of these gaps on the scale of the mean gap. So you look at the proportion of nearest neighbor gaps between these older elements, which are, let's say, between zero and x over n. Again, yeah, the typical gap, the average gap is one over n. And they, you take the limit and hope that the limit exists. And if it does exist, uh, you hope that it's given by some continuous density and then density is called the level spacing distribution. I should emphasize that the limits are not guaranteed to exist and they need not exist, but 
In many interesting cases, we believe they exist. So this is the level spacing distribution. It's this distribution of, of gaps between nearest neighbors of the sequence once you order them. So that's one quantity. I'll show you examples in the next slide. The other quantity is simpler. Um, it's called the pair correlation function. Again, it's not guaranteed to exist, but I'll give the definition. So in the, pair, the level spacing distribution, I looked at the gaps between nearest neighbors. For the uh, pair correlation function, I look at gaps between any, any two points in the sequence. So now I don't need to order them. Okay, so I look at the uh, number of gaps between any two points of the sequence, which are less than a, a given multiple of the mean gap. Again, the mean gap is one of the n. Then I divide by n and take a limit and hope that that limit exists. And if it exists, that it's given by some nice density. And that density is called the pair correlation function. Um, now, uh, let's go back to the level spacing distribution. By definition, it is a probability distribution because you are asking for an asymptotic proportion. Again, it may not exist, but if it exists, it's a probability distribution. In the case of the pair correlation function, uh, it's not a probability distribution. And uh, let's look at this definition. So how many pairs of elements do I have? I have roughly n squared pairs. So why am I dividing by n and not by n squared? So let's go through this reasoning for people who haven't seen this. Um, it's true that I have n squared pairs, but um, the average gap is one over n. So you uh, assume that, um, uh, the difference, uh, let's say that these numbers are ordered, that the difference between the two of them will be roughly j minus i over n. So as soon as j minus i is big, then you will not be less than t over n. So each xi will only have a bounded number of uh, other points which, which are distance t over n from it. And since there are n choices of xi, that's why we divide by n. Okay, so people who've digested it will have uh, learned something new. So these are the two quantities. The pair correlation is easier to define because it doesn't need this non-trivial operation of ordering the levels. It's easier to define and easier to study, uh, but it's not a probability distribution and that gives you some other problems. Uh, the level spacing distribution is very intuitive if you just stare at it. Uh, but it requires this really non-trivial operation of ordering the levels. Um, so let's look at examples, not of deterministic sequences, but of random sequences, uh, because I want to know what to aim for when trying to prove something. So the first example is what uh, is called a picket fence. You just look at capital N points, which are equally spaced. So let's say the n, uh, you look at uh, little n over capital N, little n running from one to capital N. So the difference between successive points here, you don't need to order them, they come ordered, is one over capital N. All the nearest neighbor spacing are all the same. So when you normalize them, you get uh, the normalized nearest neighbor spacings are all one. And so the level spacing distribution is just a delta function of one. So this is not very exciting, but it is what it is. It's very simple to study. Now look at, let's look at this uh, more complicated level uh, example. So you take random points in the unit in the unit interval. Random means you take capital N independent, uniformly distributed points in the unit interval. And then you, the question is, is the limiting uh, level spacing distribution? And it's an exercise in probability theory that the answer is yes. And that um, the level spacing distribution, let's say the expected value, that's the simplest thing to, to discuss. 
is given by uh, this exponential distribution. So in this plot here, it's the green curve. So I've plotted the level spacing distribution for the uh, case of uncorrelated levels. It's called the Poisson ensemble, Poisson model. Another thing that is easy to compute in this uh, model is the pair correlation function, and it turns out to be one. So here's the green plot of the pair correlation function. Again, it's not a probability density. It's, it's, it's not integrable. So that's the second example. We have the picket fence. We have the Poisson model. The third example is much more complicated. So instead of looking at random points in the unit interval, uh, you look at eigenvalues of a random matrix. Now, there are many flavors of random matrices. There's a whole subject called random matrix theory. So uh, I think the original, almost the original uh, flavor was to take uh, the so-called Gaussian ensembles, uh, for instance, the Gaussian orthogonal ensembles, which means you take a random n by n real symmetric matrix. So such matrices have real eigenvalues. So uh, randomness would mean that the matrix entries are independent Gaussians, and um, you sort of choose the variance uh, appropriately. I won't describe it. Um, Another example is um, n by n, instead of real symmetric, you can take complex submission matrices. Again, you get real eigenvalues, and that's called the Gaussian unitary ensemble. And uh, a flavor which is uh, technically easier to study is you take a random, for instance, n by n unitary matrix and look at its eigenvalue. So the matrices are random with respect to how I measure on the unitary group. The eigenvalues are random, but not independent, the, the correlations in them. This is called the circular unitary ensemble, which is Dyson's name for this particular way of choosing random matrices. In all these cases, you can work out what the level spacing distribution, the distribution of nearest neighbors. It's a non-trivial thing. And uh, it was done in the 60s. And uh, instead of writing down a complicated formula, I just, I just plotted here this red curve, which is what you get from the Gaussian orthogonal ensemble. The Gaussian unitary ensemble is visibly very close. OK, and you can also compute the pair correlation function. That's easier. And for instance, for the um, Gaussian unitary ensemble, it is given by one minus the square of the sine kernel. Um, so here is a plot of the three pair correlation functions for these models. Uh, the green one is Poisson, which was one. Um, and then there is uh, the uh, blue one is for GOE, and the orange one is for GUE, which is for GOE, it has this nice explicit formula. And what you see here is that for the random matrix theory, the um, pair correlation function vanish at the origin, as does the level spacing distribution, while for the Poisson ensemble, uh, the distributions do not vanish at the origin. And this is called level clustering, while for random matrix theory, you get what's called level repulsion. There's very small probability of having close uh, eigenvalues on the scale of the mean space. So that's what uh, we now are aiming for. So now let's see how this is encountered in real life. OK, so one version of real life is um, uh, quantum chaos. So here's a particularly simple model of a uh, quantum system. Uh, it's a quantum billiard. So what is a billiard for our purpose? It's, it's a planar domain with, let's say, piecewise smooth boundary, like this one. Then you think of this domain as a membrane, and uh, you uh, ask for its characteristic vibration. So you think of it as a drum, you beat it, and you ask for the frequencies. And the way you compute the frequencies is by solving an 
eigenvalue equation, and uh, you, meaning you look for eigenfunctions of the Laplace with uh, appropriate boundary conditions. For instance, the Irishley boundary condition just asks for vanishing of the boundary. Um, and there are eigenvalues here. That's a non-trivial thing. It was proved by Hermann Weil uh, that uh, not only are there lots of eigenvalues, we can in fact count how many there are symptotically. And Weil's law says that in the case of a planar domain, the number of levels up to eigenvalues up to x grows linearly with x asymptotically. And the coefficient uh, tells you the area of the drum. So here is a, a plot of this so-called spectral staircase. Um, there is a staircase and there's a linear approximation. And clearly you, you see the same. You see that asymptotically they're the same. And then uh, the mean spacing here is constant. If the growth is linear, it means that the average spacing is one over this prefactor. And we ask what is the spacing distribution, the level spacing distribution. It's a well-defined question. Doesn't mean it has an answer, but at least you can ask the question. And it turns out to be an extremely complicated question. We don't really have an answer uh, that we can prove in any reasonable case, but there are some fascinating conjectures that have emerged uh, about it. And um, there are two extreme cases that I'll describe. One is for instance, what happens when you take a rectangle? In the case of a rectangle, you can actually write down the eigenvalues. They are glorified sums of two squares. Um, and here is an experiment for the level spacing distribution of a rectangle whose aspect ratio is pi over three. And you clearly see Poisson here. Um, I don't know how to prove this, but numerics to me seem very convincing. And it's a purely arithmetic question because eigenvalues are given here. And this is expected to hold for other so-called integrable systems, unless there's the reason that it's not true. For instance, for a square, it's not going to be true because there are lots of multiplicities. For the sphere, it's even less true because of multiplicities. But once you recognize this, you think, okay, this is a reasonable conjecture. The other extreme is uh, when the dynamics are chaotic, whatever that means. Here is an example. You take a square and remove a concentric disk from the inside and look at the eigenvalues of the function uh, with Dirichlet boundary conditions, meaning the functions vanish on the uh, boundary of the disk and on the boundary of the circle. You don't, I don't know how to write down the eigenvalues in any explicit way, but you can numerically compute them, at least if you're an expert in doing that kind of numerical analysis. And here is one such early computation that was done a long time ago. And you clearly see something completely different than Poisson. You see level repulsion. And this uh, smooth curve here is the GOE distribution. And if you are a betting man, then you would say, okay, this is a reasonable thing. There are lots of traps you can fall into and are described in this symmetry version, but I will not go into it. So the universality conjectures is, are that in these two extremes, uh, generically at least, you will get these two distinct distribution of Poisson for integrable systems and random matrix theory for chaotic dynamics. Uh, there are exceptions, for instance, um, for the geodesic flow on the modular surface, um, the distribution looks like Poisson. But we can explain this after you see it, you can explain it away. And there's no case where these conjectures are not, no single example. Unless that problem. Okay, so the next, next uh, example is the Riemann zeros. Uh, so for people who don't remember, uh, this is the Riemann zeta function, um, it's defined by series or an infinite product over primes, and it has an analytic continuation and the functional equation relating the values at s and at one minus s. 
And the zeros of this completed zeta function are supposed to all lie on the critical line, the line of symmetry of this functional equation. That's the Riemann hypothesis, which numerically is certainly correct. And uh, the Riemann von Mangel te formula tells us how many zeros we are supposed to have up to high t, and the answer is roughly t log t, which means that the mean spacing between consecutive zeros behaves like one over log t. So to look at things like level spacings or pair correlation, you will have to rescale. They are too dense. You want to get the mean spacing to be of size one, so you have to rescale them because the zeros are getting denser and denser. And there was a, an absolutely fundamental discovery made by Montgomery about 50 years ago. And uh, he studied the pair correlation function, which I'll describe what it is in the next slide. And uh, as a result of these studies, the conjecture is that the zeros of the zeta function have random matrix theory statistics, specifically those of the Gaussian unitary ensemble. And here is a proof. Here is a computation of 10 to the five zeros near the 10 to the 12, which Oblisco did many, many years ago. And uh, you see a scatter plot here, the, the squares, and you see a smooth curve, which is the the GUE level spacing, and it's clearly the right thing. And people are not convinced by this. There are plots containing, you know, hundreds of millions of zeros near the 10 to the 24, I think, is the latest figure, which uh, are in even better fit. So uh, what Montgomery originally looked at is the pair correlation function, and his conjecture was uh, in this form, you look at pairs of zeros this, uh, with different indices, and you ask how many of the differences are at most a times the mean spacing, which is 2 pi over log t, and uh, divide by the number of zeros up to, this should be capital T. And the answer that you conjecture is that it's the integral of this kernel and the story goes is that uh, Dyson uh, pointed out that this is something that Dyson had worked on in the 60s. He wrote a series of papers on the statistical theory of um, energy levels of complex systems. And he recognized that this is what you get for the pair correlation of the GUE. And here is another plot of the pair correlation function. And the smooth plot is this factor here, one minus the square of the sine kernel, the scatter plot is the numerics for, um, again, 10 to the, the first 100,000 zeros, and it looks good. Um, so uh, these conjectures are not proven yet. There's some evidence. Again, Montgomery uh, proved that you get this, uh, uh, not exactly, but uh, at least the Fourier transforms of the two agreeing in a restricted range. And uh, you can compute, so to speak, moments of these distributions, which are not the pair correlation, but three level and 17 level correlations. And under similar restrictions, you, you get agreement. So there's actually quite reasonable evidence for this, much more so than in the case of quantum chaos. OK, so this is an example of these uh, new statistics as you see them in nature. Okay, so for the second half of the talk, well, the last third of the talk, uh, I will uh, discuss how you see these uh, pair correlation and level spacing statistics in the examples of classical uniform distribution theory. That is, you take our favorite sequence like alpha n mod one or alpha n squared mod one and ask for its pair correlation function and level spacing distribution. And this is something that uh, took a while for people to look at. The, there was a gap between Montgomery and when this was done. Uh, there's an old result, which in retrospect tells us what are the nearest neighbor spacing of the Kronecker sequence, alpha times n. And the, the, the result is called the three gap theorem, which is 
a number of parents, for instance, Vera Schurch in the 50s. And uh, here is uh, the way to find out about the theorem the hard way. You do a numeric and you don't see anything stabilizing. Um, and then you make up all kinds of uh, excuses why it doesn't stabilize, but this is the reason. So the theorem says that if you take the first 100,000 levels of the sequence, order them, this is the non-trivial thing, then the, it's most three distinct gaps that are achieved. If you take the first 200,000, again, you get at most, let's say exactly three distinct gaps that are not the same ones as you had before, but only three. And so in this particular case, there is no level spacing distribution. The limit does not exist. So it wasn't a, a, you know, an imaginary question of whether the limit exists. It need not exist even in this very natural example. So this is disappointing. So let's move to something more interesting. Instead of alpha times n, let's look at alpha times n squared, which Weil proved was uniformly distributed as long as alpha is irrational. And um, I looked at this uh, with Peter Sarnak and Alexander Zacharescu in the late 90s, almost a quarter of a century ago, I'm ashamed to say. And the conjecture that uh, we arrived at is that if alpha is Diophantine, for instance, square root of two, my favorite example, then the spacing of the level spacing distribution of alpha times n squared mod one are Poisson. So not only the level spacing, but the pair correlation functions and these other more complicated uh, correlation functions. So Diophantine covers all algebraic numbers. Uh, the formal definition is that uh, you, you cannot approximate alpha too well by rationals in this sense. So algebraic numbers are known to be like that, and uh, almost all alpha in the sense of measure theory are defective. Uh, we don't know how to prove this. The one, one of the things that we did manage to show is that for almost all alpha, the pair correlation is Poissonian for alpha n squared. And uh, we have the same result uh, if you take alpha times any integer polynomial with integer coefficients, as long as it's got degree at least two, because if the polynomial is degree one, we are back to the Kronecker sequence, which we know now doesn't have a level spacing distribution. Um, so that was the theory as, uh, of almost 25 years ago, and it was dormant for a couple of decades until uh, a new generation of people started looking at it, and there's actually new developments here. For instance, there's a nice criterion for when you can expect to get almost sure pair correlation function. Um, they abstracted uh, some of the arguments that you have in that theory, and the, in, in term, and the, the relevant quantity turns out to be the additive energy of this sequence of integers. So I take a sequence of integers. I want alpha times a n to be almost surely pair correlation Poissonian. Val says that almost surely alpha times a n is uh, uniformly distributed. So the criterion has to do with additive energy. So the additive energy is defined as the number of quadruples uh, of coincidences between pairs. That's the definition. So by definition, um, it's at most n cubed because if I know k, l, and m, then I know a of n. And it's at least n squared because if I take k equals m and l equals n, I certainly get the coincidence. Um, so it's the additive energy is between n squared and n cubed always for any sequence of distinct integer. And then uh, the criterion was that if the additive energy is slightly less than the upper bound, than the trivial upper bound, so slightly less here is n cubed over the power of log n, then almost surely um, alpha times an is Poisson pair correlation. 
Um, so that's a positive result. There's an interesting negative result. Uh, if you look at the sequence of primes, well, then the additive energy can be computed. Uh, it doesn't fall into this upper bound, but the, this is not a necessary and sufficient condition. But Alec Walker showed that almost surely the pair correlation is not Poisson. So here's an interesting sequence where you can show that almost surely you don't have Poissonian pair correlation. So this is integer sequences. Um, it's a good thing I'm not looking at the chat. Otherwise I'd tell Julia off. Um, now let's look at non-integer uh, powers. So instead of n squared, I want to do n to the half. Okay, so uh, n to the half is a particularly interesting sequence. As I mentioned, um, uh, Fayer had proven that alpha times root n is uniformly distributed. In the 1920s or 30s. Um, in the 90s, in the late 90s, uh, Michael Boschernitz did some numerics on this, and he discovered a picture like this for the level space and distribution. So that doesn't look like Poisson. It doesn't look like anything we've seen before. Um, and Noam Elkis and Kurt McMullen proved that the level spacing distribution of the fractional parts of Lucan does exist. And they computed what it was, what it is. It's, it's a definite thing, but it's not Poisson, it's not random matrix theory, you don't see level repulsion. Um, it's one of these algebraic measures that come up in homogeneous dynamics, and they use homogeneous dynamics in, in studying this. Uh, it's got this funny property that it's actually constant. The level space in distribution is a constant in the in interval near the origin, and then it decays, but it doesn't like decay exponentially. It's got uh, algebraic decay. So it's not Poisson. It's not Poisson. It can be determined, but it's not Poisson. So this is number one. The second development is a very curious one. So Jens Marklov and Daniel Elsbaz and Ilya Vinogradov show, computed the pair correlation function of root n mod one. So you have to remove uh, n's which are squares, otherwise you get uh, multiplicities. But once you do that, uh, you can use these methods of homogeneous dynamics to study the pair correlation function. And surprisingly to me and to them, they show that the pair correlation is Poissonian. Um, if you don't know what to make of this, I mean, it is what it is. Um, so uh, let's try to perturb the problem. Instead of looking at square root of n, let's look at uh, cube root of two times square root of n mod one. And here is an empirical plot of the level spacing distribution. And this looks Poisson. If you compare it to what happens to one times root n, they are clearly different, except this is a theorem and this is a conjecture. This is a conjecture. So we don't know this, but I think it's an interesting conjecture. Um, let's say if you take, okay, let's say cube root two times root n, numerically the level spacing distribution, the nearest neighbor gap distribution, it's clearly Poisson. So I was very intrigued by this and, and tried for a while to say uh, something about the pair correlation function of this. And eventually uh, with Nicholas Tech now, who was at that time a postdoc in Tel Aviv, and I think is now in Caltech. He's usually everywhere dense, but I think physically he's in Caltech right now. Um, we managed to show that the pair correlation function alpha times root n is Poissonian for almost all alpha without giving a single example that will come later. Um, 
So what do we know about this theory? And this is all very, very recent. So I started in the beginning of the 20th century. Now let's move to um, the last year or two. Uh, so Christoph Eisleitner, Daniel Elbers, and Mark Munch uh, understood how to do alpha times n to the theta, provided theta is a non-integer, which is bigger than one. And they show that almost surely the pair correlation here is Poisson. But the method, uh, they kept complaining that the method doesn't work for theta less than one. And this, um, I'm quite happy that they failed because I was really interested in theta equals a half. And we succeeded in doing this for theta between zero and one. And so now we know that for all theta, alpha times n to the theta mod one is Poissonian, except when theta is one. The integer case is what I did with Peter Sark a quarter of a century ago, and now any non-integer theta is known. Um, and in this case of alpha n to the theta, there's also a deterministic result, which I think is uh, very beautiful by Chris Lutzko and Niklas Teknow. And they prove that alpha times n to the theta is Poissonian for almost, for, not for almost, all, for all alpha, provided theta is less than one third or slightly even better than that. But they can't get to a half. The method actually fails uh, to half. So this is the state of the art uh, for alpha n to the half, which is uh, what I started out with in this section. So let me end um, with two, with some of the ingredients, just two slides. I, I, I'll be happy if I finish ahead of time. Uh, so this is number theory. At the end of the day, this is number theory. So until now it was hiding, but let's, let me explain what it is that you need to do here. So let's start with a case when theta is two or integers. When theta is an integer bigger than one. So after doing some harmonic analysis, what we reduced to is counting solutions of a Diophantine inequality, which in the case when theta is an integer is actually inequality. Okay, so I look at the number of integers, there are six integers involved, number of six tuples of integers, roughly all of the same size. So that the difference of, so that the size of this um, polynomial is bound is less than one. So if they're all integers, if theta is two, let's say, these are all integers, then it means that uh, this difference is zero. Okay. So in the case theta equals two, we are asked to count how many solutions there are of this Diophantine equation in variables which are roughly of the same size of size capital N. And what the theory needs is that the number of the solutions is slightly less than N to the fourth. Now let's do this in the case when theta is two. Let's understand how many solutions does the system have. Okay, so what I do is I fix the right-hand side here. I fix J2, X2 and Y2 and ask, so there's n cube choices, and then I ask how many triples j1, x1, y1 I have, which for which j1 times the difference of these squares hits a definite number. And the answer is uh, there are very few such choices because, because uh, you're using now that you have x squared here. So x squared minus y squared factors as x minus y times x plus y. This is deep stuff. Um, and then you ask how many triples of j, x, and y there are so that this product e equals a definite number of size at most n cubed. And the answer, it's a divisor function. And there are very few divisors of a number that's at most k to the epsilon. Uh, choices and uh, n cube choices of j2, x2, and y2, and therefore we found that there are at most n to the three plus epsilon solutions, which is within what we need. 
So this is how you solve the problem, roughly speaking, in the case that theta is an integer, as long as that integer is bigger than one. When theta is one, it doesn't work. Last slide, thankfully, is what to do with non-integer theta. Then this trick doesn't work. So I still need to solve this Diophantine inequality, but now it's a genuine inequality. Think of theta being the half. Um, so I have six variables, so n to the six options, and I need less than n to the full solution. So just to say heuristic, um, the size of this um, polynomial is roughly n to the, this is j is n, x to the theta is n to the theta. So this is n to the one plus theta. So you take n to the six points and put them in an interval of length n to the one plus theta. If every integer, if every point is sort of equally likely, you expect n to the four minus theta solutions. And that's, that would be enough for what you need. Um, except it, uh, if theta is big, this is actually wrong because there's diagonal solutions. You take j1 equals j2, x1 equals x2, y1 equals y2, you clearly have a zero for this polynomial and there's n cubed such points. So you shouldn't take this too literally. So what uh, Heisleitner, Elbaz and Munch did is they, they use the decoupling, let's call it. Um, they reduce this system to a system of four variables, essentially this kind of system. So now you have, we got rid of the J's. This is important. And you're asking for the number of solutions of this Diophantine inequality. And uh, Robert and Sargo actually uh, did this not that long ago. Um, and you can count, you can give an upper bound uh, for the number of solutions of this inequality, you find in inequality. So there are diagonal solution, x1 equals y1, x2 equals y2, that gives you n squared, m squared solution. So this is this term. And this term is this uh, random heuristic that I explained to you. So at least this upper bound makes some sense. Now, uh, the decoupling of this Robert Sargo theorem was sufficient for theta bigger than one, but I wanted theta equals a half. And then you had to have some extra steps. And uh, we managed to do these extra steps. I won't get into this. Um, uh, uh, I Sleitner, Baz, and Munch needed to know something about the Riemann zeta function. That's what you use for. The counting, they need to know, to know a subconvex bound, any subconvex bound would do, and we needed some other things. In any case, this is the state of the art now for this particular example. Uh, so let me just conclude with uh, leave you with a couple with some homework. So the, I mentioned uh, these problems. So if alpha is Diophantine, I want to show that alpha times n squared is Poissonian. The level spacing is Poissonian. We know pair correlation, we don't know level spacing. And instead of root n, um, let's do alpha times root n. I explained that almost surely we know that the pair correlation is Poissonian and I want the level spacing distribution. And here's the experiment, it's clearly true, but I don't know how to prove it. So this is homework for people. Okay, thank you. I will stop here.